Welcome back to another episode of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. I am James Yost, Partner and Wealth Advisor at Signature FD, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Travis York, owner of 3-1 Advisors. Travis, how are you? I'm doing great today, James. How about yourself? I'm doing well. We are back with another episode of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. James Yost and Travis York, as always. Travis, how are you feeling today, my friend? Other than a little cold weather here in Atlanta, I'm feeling pretty good. Oh boy. It's a tad of After coming back from spring break and dealing with 90 degree weather down in Florida, it was a little cold to get off the plane to 35 degrees. Well, I think spring is upon us. I think in the next few days, we're going to start to see some better weather. So what are we talking about today? Who do we well, got? I, I, I'm real excited. We've got Nick Uva with Southern Veterinary Partners with us today. I don't know. We got a lot of different things on the on the agenda. We may pull some stuff off that, that wasn't originally here, but we are excited to just dig in with Nick. Nick, you've been in the vet space, what, over 10 years now on the forefront of of some of the acquisitions and and also, you know, kind of really in the in the weeds of laying the right operational foundation in place for hospitals. So, I mean, you know, I think what we want to dive into is is some of your background, some of the crazy craziness of the transaction market over the last three years. See if you're up for any prognostications on where the world is going. And, and just kind kind of go from there, and and potentially maybe even hit a little bit of the, the recap world if that if that works for you. That works for me. All right. Well, I, I mean, I guess you know I'll just kick it off. You were what not employee number one, but right at the very no. beginning, another veterinary partners, right? Yeah. And, not not the extreme beginning. I, I witnessed it from basically inception for Dr. J. Price and his third, first three hospitals, but I was not there. I came on board around hospital number twenty seven in the very beginning of twenty eighteen. Very good. Very good. Well, you know, I was interested, you know, obviously you've been close to it, you know, from a a personal perspective, what was the vision of Southern Veterinary Partners when it started and how has that led to to you guys being one of the largest owners of veterinary hospitals in the United States? Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, thank you for having me on. I'm I'm, I'm hoping that from your recent podcast with uh, Ben Pate, that I'm able to live up to the same expectations. I know we're not discussing bourbon, but anytime you guys want to get anecdotal as far as alcohol is concerned, we can always go that route. But I I'm hoping that mine won't be boring compared to his uh, bourbon expression. So that was a, I learned a lot on that one. Hey, uh, hey, uh, next, time, next time you're here, we're happy to host you right. at, the, at the office over a drink and, a, and another podcast. There we go. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Yeah. So. I could talk to you about the vision of which I was trying to establish for early on, but it's a great story to hear it really from an outside perspective and kind of witnessing it from afar initially. And I made the jokes when Jay had first started with his three hospitals, and I was notified by Southern Valley Partners when one of my current colleagues, Ashley Sams, who mentioned, hey, there's this small pop, most startup group that's, you know, out of Birmingham, Alabama. And at the time, there was really only about a dozen groups that were out in the consolidation space, the big ones that everyone's familiar with, and then some of the smaller private equity groups that were starting to pop up. And like everyone else, I probably made the same joke of, ah, they'll get to 30 or 50 and flip the damn thing to uh, you know, a larger entity that's out there. And you know, through that, it was interesting because you know, the original goal that Jay wanted was at the time, it's probably not as novel as it was back in 2014 when he started it. Shore Capital Partners was the original private equity investor then and still our financial sponsor. It was to basically create something a little different. And again, this is going to sound kind of almost cliche just from the standpoint that this exists now, right? It's a monkey see, monkey do world. However, at the time with those hospitals, it's it, he really wanted to first and foremost have an entity that was based around medical autonomy for the veterinarians to really just let, again, to be redundant vets be vets, to allow the hospitals to maintain preservation of culture, you know, just really no branding and where it's a blanket to the client where you would have no idea the difference between, you know, a, the a corporately held practice versus an independent practice. And but to provide unparalleled support. And clearly that takes time to develop, it takes a number of years to put the, the resources and reinvest into the company. No, but the vision initially was, hey, we want to provide unparalleled support in areas of of data, data analytics, marketing, to really, you know, Jay foresaw recruiting as becoming an increasingly more difficult thing for all companies, you know, independent vets and the largest entities out there to really kind of, you know, grab the bull by the horns and get an earlier process. By no means 
fixing, right, or solving the issues of, of staffing shortages, but getting ahead of it and, and trying to do our best to make sure that we're aligned where, you know, part, partner hospitals will be versus where we can support them the right way from, from a regional as well as a, a, a national perspective. That's great. Appreciate the background there. I mean, can we, let's dig in a little bit. I mean, if you're, sure. if you're out there taking a look at practices on a regular basis mm-hmm. and trying to figure out who could potentially be a good partner for you all, um, what are some of the things you think are foundationally important with respect to owning a successful veterinary hospital? And, you know, you can touch on it from a small hospital network perspective or an individual clinic, or maybe even scale it up to large if there's, if there are things that kind of transcend the size. So, uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? You know, the single biggest thing, there's two really, well, there's two single, I guess that's not the right way to put it, but the two largest things, right? Single being culture. It's hard to assess the culture of a hospital. One of the biggest fears that an uh, individual selling their practice or corporate entity is, is what is my life going to be like after the sale, right? And that's a very justifiable concern. To us, it's really no different, right? It's who is that individual or group of individuals that we're partner with? How are they going to be partners is relatively one of our concerns as well. Is, is the culture that they're bringing to the table and that they're going to continue a good culture, regardless of an individual practice's size or a group of practices? Honestly, we all know, right? Culture at the end of the day basically eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. Very hard thing to assess. You can assess that through things that are, you know, as simplistic as Google reviews. And there's been some phenomenal data as to revenue trends associated with Google reviews as well. And we put a lot of merit to that. And we definitely look into those and read them, et cetera. But ultimately, it take that aside from culture, because again, it's it's hard to always pinpoint exactly. It's it's the opportunity for continued growth inside that practice. You know, there's different groups at different life cycles of where they are in either their fund or where they're referring to. But ultimately, as the environment has changed from a macroeconomic environment, but also the consolidation market itself, the emphasis on, you know, being able to service debt, right, and to partner with the right hospitals means hospitals that are on a trajectory of continued growth. And that's important. And, and we can get deeper, if you guys like, into what kind of fuels that growth. But as written by a gentleman I know through SEPA or Certified Exit Planning Advisory, he's not in the veterinary space, but Justin Goodbread, I don't know if you guys have read his book, uh, Your Baby's Ugly. It kind of <laughs> talks about the, the minutia of some of these things that really a practice owner, they don't see it right day in and day out. And sometimes it's the most simple things that can really change how the hospital, quite frankly, will continue to grow. So I just, I want to jump back a little bit. You, you know, sure. I'll put you on the spot, Nick. You said no, you're fine. Good, good culture, yep. which I, like, I, I get it. Nobody wants to buy a toxic culture. Absolutely. Uh, is there one thing like, and don't even think about it so much from SVP's perspective, right? But if you were starting a business, yeah. what's, what are the two or three things that you would put into that being a good culture? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, the leadership structure and living the vision, essentially, of what you're trying to mutually accomplish from a hospital's perspective or a business's perspective or whatever it might be is got to be uniform, right? And not militants, just make sure that everyone's on the same understanding of the path going forward, how you want to work, how you want to operate. For ours, it's very simplistic, right? We For SVP, it's, it's WAG, right? It's work together, amaze, and grow. Very simple, right? If you're as long as everyone's collaborating, you know, as long as we're providing truly good hospitality, right? Good customer service at every level within the hot, within the business to each other from an employee to employee standpoint, but the the clients as well. And growth takes on different ways, right? Growth is not just us growing from, you know, a business standpoint, but individual and personal growth. That lends to a culture is that you have people that have that buy-in and those people around, they're going to be the right people in the right seats of the bus. The bus is going to move the right direction. And that's obviously very important. Then you have to have essentially the leadership that are constantly living that culture and making sure that you're staying in that realm, right? I, sidebar, but I had an opportunity a while back at one of these meetings that we all get to go to in this industry. And I remember sitting with uh, Howard Putnam, who was that retired CEO of Southwest in their heyday. He actually was part of Brand Fair Lines that went bankrupt. Wow. I remember him asking how they kind of really built up culture. And that really stuck with me. And we talked about it briefly. And he's like, Nick, I, you have no idea. I literally got involved in the day in and day out. You know, we, I got involved with literally working with baggage 
carriers from the plane to, you know, the, the airport and made sure that everyone truly understood and everyone was living that mission. Again, in, in our terms, it's Jay's original hospitals as, you know, no one's too important to, to pick up the poop. So it's, <laughs> everyone's working in the same realm, though. He, he always joked there's a different expletive that was four letters that he used. And yeah, yeah. I've heard that a few times. It's true, right? So you asked that question of how do you build that culture? It's consistency, it's messaging, and it's just making sure that everyone believes in it. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, coming from our side where we're working with a lot of folks who have sold in the past to whomever, feedback that we've gotten from folks who've worked and partnered up with SVP has been some of the best, I would say, across the industry and for a lot of different things. But the culture is a huge piece of that. I mean, obviously, we can talk about the financial benefit and the recruiting, but I think it's like the integration of two different entities into a common vision that really propels everybody forward, which is some of the feedback we've gotten. So that's awesome. And we try not to pick any favorites out here on the podcast, no, but you know, I just thought I'd throw that out there because I think it's important. And I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just take that just Please. one step forward is that, you know, as far as the culture is concerned, and, and I think all good entities, and I know you guys don't want to pick favorites, but there's a lot of companies, right, that do it really well. And there's obviously some that just don't necessarily see it. There's two types of culture, and it's that blend that you just talked about. So the WAG values that we kind of live by, it's it's what bridges the cultures between what we do at SVP corporate, but also what the clinic, right, the hospital, the individual location does. because. We're made up of roughly 370 individual cultures, and that's a hard thing. That is a very difficult thing to have everybody maintain their culture, but it's, in my opinion, the right way to do it. That's mm-hmm. the bridge that enables them to – their culture is what's most important. Their culture is what's, quite frankly, what's customer-facing, right? But as long as those core things are there, I think it leads. So, Yeah, no, that's good. We've talked a little bit about SVP's background, some mm-hmm. differentiation, some uh, some of the things you've learned along the way. Let's get into the transaction market a little bit. Obviously, I think it goes without saying to most of our listeners, I mean, it's been a pretty eventful past three years in the markets, mm-hmm. to say the least. Before I opine on it too much, I mean, would love to just, you know, in one word, what would you use to describe the last three years? I think the word that I've been using lately is probably not even appropriate. I've been saying the word turbulent, but that's probably more the last six months. I I think maybe a better word for the last three years would be crescendo, right? Mm -hmm. Basically the highest point reached in a progressive increase of intensity or not necessarily stealing from the music term, but I guess it's one and the same. We've just seen a buildup. Um, we're very fortunate to be in an industry that's recession weatherable, and now we've learned pandemic resistant. And so many factors have fueled what we've in other industries have experienced very similar lift. But what we've seen in the last probably three to four years is, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's probably unprecedented. You've had a combination of the perfect storm. Right. You've had first and foremost that trillion dollar opportunity that was written in the book by Peter Christmas back in like 06 that talked about just, you know, the, the magnitude of baby boomers retiring and selling their businesses. And in veterinary, we experience the same thing, right? And it's not just about retirement, it's partnership, but you're gonna have that. That's a that's a transitional strategy or a secession plan is to eventually pass your business on. You had that compounded with, you know, visit trends increasing, some a little bit of a burnout component fueled by also you also had additional space in terms of just work corporate consolidators entering into the market because we've had since the housing market crash of 08 you've had more entries into the flight of safety that's been our business so more private equity focus more competition created obviously just much more movement much more build up and then it really in 2020 we uh, you know, leading up to the election, uh, we, like, we kind of call internally the Biden the fact that's not meant to be a political thing. It's just there were obviously business owners having concerns of 41 percent long term capital gains yep. with also the uh, the pandemic effects of just kind of burnout with the visit trends. But that was obviously just above a beard. It forced some people to, in some cases, move the process along quicker than they had originally desired. Or in some cases, maybe they moved too quick. Sometimes folks really were able to capitalize on the right time. That's fantastic as well. You know, same thing with 2021. And then we've all seen it, right? And that's something we talked about before was just the macroeconomic environment and where the Fed has increased rates to obviously curb 
you know, uh, inflation, CPI, and essentially that these rate hikes have like, changed the narrative a little bit. So everything was pretty much constantly build up, build up. And I just feel like maybe June of 2022 through August, everyone started going, hmm, something's up. And then August through November, you really started to see the market kind of uh, change in a different direction. I mean, I know we hadn't really planned to discuss the latest developments in the banking sector, but since you kind of brought it up and the Fed's hiking path, it's interesting. The market was implying an additional 50 basis point rate increase and really was was forecasting rate increases throughout the year. And we're talking on Tuesday, what do we got? March 14th. And so really it was the news on Friday that was that was kind of spooked people. But the bond market has completely repriced interest rate increased probabilities going forward. I mean, the market's now implying Fed cutting rates by the end of the year, which is obviously not what they were signaling really earlier in the week last week. So pretty crazy week for the bond market, which obviously has ancillary impacts to anybody who borrows money. So just quickly, and we don't need to get into the weeds too much. I know this is a fast moving story and it's just kind of chaotic out there, but would love your take on what the impacts, you know, maybe some initial impacts to the veterinary space and potentially any impacts to the to the acquisition space. I mean, what we're seeing is kind of interestingly enough, people are looking at this as maybe this was what needed to break for the Fed to stop hikes, which could obviously have good good impacts across a couple of industries. But what are, what's your take? And I know that this is kind of putting me on the spot. I know we had really no, talked okay. about Listen, my, my, in my former life, I worked in the financial advisory capacity up until about 9-11, but no means uh, my uh, economic indicator. I am uh, not the oracle of Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, if, it, yeah. if you can, if you really look and really to answer your question, just if we go back slightly to that August time frame, right, when the, the Fed just kept obviously piling on rate hikes over and over again, it's, we've had a great economy, which has, you know, been fantastic, but We've seen inflation right at the same time of a good economy. So with those rate hikes, every organization, for the most part, has been using the debt market, right? Service using debt to do acquisitions. Mm -hmm. So any acquisition that we're coming on, if obviously the rates are more, the cost of of borrowing money is obviously increased in the most simplistic terms. We'll probably hear this parallel a couple of times. I'm sure you've heard this many times. Is you, you look at buying a home, right? If you're buying a house and that that value has switched quite a bit, or the the amount to the loan that you're going to take over, say a 30 year fix or whatever the, the type of loan it is, it's going to be costing you more money to have the same house that you would have had previously. So that you saw that change in late summer Q3, Q4, where I'm sure some of your listeners are part of this. You saw a lot of you know a lot of people, quite frankly, were Deals were paused, deals were halted. Everyone was just trying to grasp where things were going on. In some cases, deals were walked back or, or, or stopped. You know, across, and I've heard a, a lot of this go on throughout the industry. And it's really changed how groups, for the most part, are, are proceeding. It's, I think groups have always done a really good job being very cautious. Um, I can definitely say, not the commercial for SVP, but we have always been a very cautious steward of the investment and who we're partnering with. And sometimes to my point where I was like, yeah, God, into certain practices you just love to partner with and it wouldn't fit a model. But those terms became even more strict. And those, mm-hmm. those uh, you know, the different parameters around what makes an acquirable practice acquirable became even more tightly controlled because you needed to make sure that the probability and the certainty of continued growth was going to be there to service the debt on the acquisition. So that has slowed down with that, with the ample multiples that the company industry has seen, right? Over the last few years, that has relatively been brought down quite a bit because of the lack of frenzy in purchasing. So it's paused some people in wanting to uh, sell their practice, right? And, and definitely slowed down the amount of actual acquisitions that occurred. But ultimately, that's where it's brought us to today. I think we've kind of reached a plateau. I think we've been watching, obviously, the Fed's going to meet again here, what, uh, I think at the end of the month, the 20th yep. to the 21st, if I'm not next, mistaken. Ne- next week. Next week, yeah. So the month's getting away from me. I know tomorrow's the eyes of March, <laughs> so we're getting close. <laughs> but yeah, and what I was really interested in, I guess, to bring up to your statement before, was we were all thinking it's going to be 50 basis points, and that May would then be maybe a signal of 25, and that might change at level where we are and level set things. It's... I don't think things will return back to the way they were before from a volume or an offer perspective, but 
I think we're at a new level. And I think what the industry just needs now is things to kind of settle a little bit. And that as long as there's consistency, companies are going to resume normal activity. Well, that's a really interesting point, Nick. I'd love to get your take, right? Like, again, unfortunately, at this juncture in my life, I'm getting older and I've lived through some lower rates and some higher rates, right? But, you know, I, I think it'd be, I'd love for you just to share your take for our listeners on interest rates, right? Because like, oh, there's been all this panic, like, oh, interest rates are so high. I, I mean, to your point, I think business, once once they know where rates are going to go and there's stability, they can move forward and take action. It's really the instability. It's not the correct. higher interest rates that's slowing things up. That's absolutely correct. I mean, for great historical references, I remember complaining in what, 07, think about the year of purchase of the first house I built. And I, I remember it was like an 8%, if I'm not mistaken, for a 30 year fixed and right around that. Right? And then I remember uh, my father, who's in his 80s, was like in, in 1980, his was 13.8%. So, <laughs> speaking, quite, quite, quite drastic. And there's always, I mean, you can see it right now, right? There's still consumer spending at high levels, still people vacationing. And so it'll be a softer landing, I think, that anyone expect. But it doesn't need to be techo, what you said. It does not need to be that rates will go in one direction or the other. I think banks, coupled with acquisition companies, just need to see stability in the market to make sure that, hey, we know what to predict. We know how we're going to be able to service that debt. And then we can look into still what we discussed before is are those growth rates by the individual, you know, acquirable target going to be there to enable that to be a worthwhile investment. So I was just going to end with this, uh, Travis, with regard to, I, I think you, the companies are always right. There's always going to be a need for companies to use acquisitions as a model for growth, right? There's depending on where you are in your, your company cycle, you may require more acquisitions or you may have more operational focus. The bigger companies tend to be more operational focused. We're kind of that mindset as well, but acquisitions are still very part of what we do for growth. And that's what we'll continue to do. I think that things will resume as we proceed in this year as far as volume of, of acquisitions occurring, but I, 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 terms probably are still going to maybe plateau or maybe slightly tighten depending on what occurs. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I just I kind of wanted to take this and, and pivot a little bit because we've been talking, you know, at the at the hospital level and, sure. you know, obviously we've seen hospital levels slow up. But one of the big things that I think would be great for us to share with our listeners is some information on something that we call recap strategic mm -hmm. acquisitions. Like what are you seeing at the at the higher level? Nick, like, you know, for a company like SVP, sure. who, what does a recap mean? And how is the current world of things slowing up impacting those companies that are that are looking at that, looking at that? So maybe can you just start by sharing with our yeah. listeners what a what a recap versus strategic acquisition is? Sure. So a recapitalization, right, or a liquidity event is something where any private equity company essentially over a period of time, you hear people will throw numbers out there of three to seven years, I think five being predominantly the average. Although the private equity groups would like sooner than later, right, return on their investment. The essence of the goal is, right, these organizations want to be able to operationally move you guys forward or any entity into a forward uh, with more revenue growth, become more profitable. And at the point, right, almost sell your, your group to a larger private equity investor once the organization has relatively doubled. What that means to someone who's, you know, part of a hospital or an individual being acquired. You know, there's different companies that do different levels of equity. And as far as that recapitalization occurs, that's an opportunity for, again, liquidity and depending on model of the structure. And it's an opportunity at that point, depending on where you can become part of that investment, to liquidate your shares into cash or to reinvest at that point. From more of a widespread or 30,000 foot view, you look at different companies that are out there. If, if, Multiples are dropping somewhat, so exit multiples, right? We're in the same boat as far as how the market moves, but we're also seeking that stability in any company that's getting geared up or positioned for that recapitalization. You, it will occur, but again, people are being mindful to where the rates are, what the trends are, and it's prudent to not do it. Right? There are companies that can, and we are obviously ready to take that next step for our next recapitalization as a company, but you wouldn't do it in a market that's a little bit more unstable, just no different that we've got a couple of companies in this industry that would love to do an initial public offering and you wouldn't do it right while the market's uncertain as well. So um, I think there was another question layered in what you asked. I want to make sure I addressed it. 
Was that it? Well, uh, yeah, that kind of, I mean, I think that helps really kind of walk through what a recap may look like. So, you know, in that sense, it's just additional sponsor supporting further growth right. and continued expansion of the business. Compare that a little bit for a strategic mm-hmm. acquisition, right? Which I think is something that we're going to start seeing a little bit more of in, mm-hmm. in the industry, yeah. given the fact that, you know, we're staring down somewhere between 70 and 125 different consolidators, depending upon, you know, what you consider a consolidator. What what does a strategic acquisition actually mean and, and how does that look, Nick? Yeah, I don't really know the exact number. Maybe you know better than I do in terms of how many groups are out there, but I think you were definitively spot on as far as the, the next wave or the future waves will be some higher increase in consolidation amongst the consolidators. It's it's a natural evolution. I think every industry that kind of goes through this part of their life cycle is primed for that. And I just I'm sure you guys will agree and tell me if I'm wrong. There's just probably, you know, and the ones I've counted, there's roughly about 60, 65 from what I know of, but there's ones popping up all the time. It's a, it's a bit busy, <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> there just seems to be so many. I mean, you go to these large conferences and when you go to uh, like BMX or Western and you see that there's, you know, more consolidator presence there than some cases, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing companies, that that's a pretty big indicator, I think, of where things are probably going to go. You know, essentially a strategic acquisition, you know, merger or an acquisition of one company or another really to, you know, to do that is going to become, I guess, a commonplace. I'm trying to make sure I address that question. I think you'll see it. It's whether is is the size of the company first and foremost, whether you're the acquirer or the acquiree is going to be very dependent, right? There's certain antitrust laws that will prevent or there might be some spinoffs that occur in certain areas. But if it makes sense for some of the really small entities to be gobbled up. You know, initially, if there's synergies there, it's going to make sense for that company to do so and bring them in. Now, if it's a, a third party strategic buyer, right, someone out of the realm, which I think will be lesser of a part, maybe it's down the road. If you're talking about companies that want to diversify their portfolio, that's less likely to be probably major changing, if you will, from a strategic standpoint. But I do think you will see more of that. It's just depending on the size. Again, it's going to be there won't be. You'll see it snowball, I think, as time progresses. Yeah. So our listeners and our clients and folks we've you know just spent time getting to know throughout the throughout this mm-hmm. cycle. I mean, they they've they have different business structures that they've either entered into or are considering. I mean, some will uh, as part of their transaction receive equity at the at the platform level. Some will have a joint venture. Some will have both. Not to get too deep into you know preferred shares or anything like that. So like let's take sure. that off the table just for sake of simplicity. But looking at someone who has common stock at the platform level versus someone who has a joint venture, how are they affected differently in the event of a recap? Yeah, I mean, so common equity or you know C units or whatever the you know, vernacular is that the entity is using is the basically shares and hold co. There's really no major difference other than when it occurs and there's a recapitalization, obviously, there's the opportunity to liquidate, right? So the liquidity of that will give, and again, it, it, there's a few things that are dependent upon that. So if you entered in when there's no more issuance of common equity, you may have an obligation to hold some of that equity past if there's a recap coming up to the subsequent one. So it's a matter of time frame, right, in terms of where it enters. But the liquidity event is there for folks to obviously reinvest, right? If there's a tax deferral component that they're looking for or liquidate because that's the goal of what they're trying to accomplish to diversify how they're utilizing that money. From a JV standpoint, it's different, right? The, they're, the retained ownership of the individual hospital that they're looking at, if that recapitalization occurs, for the most part, and there's exceptions to every rule, private equity likes joint ventures, and usually there's the optionality, right, for the individual to, you know, there's most LOIs, there's a sale call put options in there, and there's a call is the ability for the parent company to call the remaining component does not mean that the joint venture or the retained ownership for that individual has to be surrendered at that time. It could actually continue going forward, but it certainly is an opportunity at that point for the minority owner to cash in on that part of the business should they like to at that point. No, I, I mean, I think and that's super helpful just for our our listeners to, to understand what that difference is, right? Because there's a lot of different ownership forms that are running around out there right now. I guess, you know, one of the things that is is really interesting to me is 
what's your take on what's going to happen in the recap market, right? Like we talked about the big crescendo and, and I think the crescendo happens, whether it be at the individual hospital level, at the smaller consolidator level, or even at the larger level, what are your thoughts on, will we see a point where some of the recaps start to pick up uh, again? And do you have any insight into what might be a factor that drives that? I mean, I guess we kind of hit on a little bit earlier. It's probably stability to some extent, but yeah, any, I mean, that's, any that's, insight people there? I, I mean, that's just, you just said it. I mean, you're going to know as well as I do. It's going to be, in, it's going to be first and foremost, the stability in the market are things stable and they stable for quite a while, but also that's going to be compounded or coupled with our, is that individual entity at that point in their growth cycle, right? How have they been performing? How have they operationally been performing over the last couple of years leading up to their next recapitalization period? So a betting man for me says, if we start seeing stability, you know, either normalization of rate hikes or stoppage or even a rate cut, that's a pretty good indicator that maybe we'll start seeing some activity in the marketplace. I'd like to say as early as Q4, but I, I would be guessing. Uh, I would say <laughs> the earlier part of you know 2024, and as 2024 progresses, you know, pending obvious different things at a car and in the global environment is, you know, you'll start to see it. And believe it or not, again, it doesn't take doesn't have to always be a great economy. This this whole buildup that we've experienced was early on the. The launching pad was the 08 when people were coming to veterinary as a, as a flight to safety. So, yeah, I mean, if the even if the market really goes in a different direction, it's not going to impact. But I think you'll start to see companies resume in the re, in the recapitalization process. Yeah, I agree with that completely. No, that's that's definitely yeah, we're we're in alignment there. So, thoughts from your from your end, given where the market is, and like from my perspective. 2022 is the year where everybody was afraid of inflation for a good reason. And that was seemingly the topic du jour, at least in the investment community and, you know, surely at the small business level. 2023, it seems like people are now more focused on some sort of recession that is uh, uh, apparently happening or has happened or will happen, depending on which news network you turn on. Correct. What what are your thoughts there? I mean, what are you seeing as some of the biggest opportunities right now in the vet space? And then what are some of the risks that you're focused on mitigating as y'all are out there in the community? Are you speaking and pardon the clarification of the question here, but just from an acquisition standpoint or just operational? I would say both. I mean, so when you're looking at looking at an acquisition and then also as y'all look to continue to grow that practice and enhance profitability. So yeah, both opportunities and risks with those two in regard. Yeah, there, there's obvious opportunity that's going to happen, right? COVID presented more pet ownership during that period that we've now seen a little bit of flattening occur, not so much with ownership, but with visit trends, right? Coming into the hospital, at least that's what we see, not speaking SVP specifically, but from a national average perspective, I think that's going to ramp up quite a bit too, because as these pet aides, they're going to require more visits. So that's only unfortunately going to be met with a risk, right? Which is how many vets are there to service? What's the staffing level? And I think having, you know, more staffing on board is is vital right now. I think that's going to be important, you know, having the opportunity to, to meet the demands because the hospital individually, if they become birds like they did with COVID and they're, you know, speaking from an individual hospital perspective and from an operation standpoint, turning away clients is kind of a red flag. And if you have that staffing to meet that, you don't want to overstaff, but you want to be able to be able to take in and work in clients when need be so you can maintain that normal growth and, and projections. From an acquisition standpoint, you're going to always see waves down the road. Uh, there will be opportunity and there is opportunity, quite frankly, now. Just in the last six months, you've seen a lot of groups approach us, a lot of uh, individuals that were part of the expression, but left at the altar. Or some, quite frankly, they're like a little bit of concern that they may have missed what's gone on. You're seeing a bit of a bump right now with individuals kind of hurrying to that and, and probably rightfully so. Uh, I still think we're in a level of a, in a new plateau of where we're going to be at. But I think the opportunity for acquisition is quite frankly still there, provided that expectations have been reset. I think that's very important that attorneys, CPAs, brokers, financial advisors, everyone's kind of on the same plane with regard to where is the new norm currently. And that obviously helps things go forward uh, much more rapidly and in a much smoother process. 
think it's just it's such a positive to hear that you know you still see opportunity and you know, the biggest the biggest risk is is just really at the end of the day being able to, to support the demand. Correct. Yeah. The demand that will be there it may not feel like that right now. And there's different people approaching it right now in different facets, but the opportunity I think will always be there. And then there will be future waves, right? As some of these new start hospitals that are out there will start, you know, either aging, maturing or having themselves as considered an acquirable hospital, that will always be an opportunity. It's also an opportunity too for individuals that want to buy in to quite frankly, buy it at lower thresholds than they have previously before. They're no longer, I wouldn't say they're priced properly for them, but they're definitely easier to get into some levels uh, if they can. But it's, uh, you know, still there's a major difference between an individual versus a, you know, a private equity back end that they try to buy. Yeah, I think that is an interesting point, right? There's certain hospitals now that were very private equity, smaller, you know, say a three doctor hospital was a definitive, you know, nice target for private equity that now may be a middle of the road type of target based upon the current circumstances and opportunities and risks that are out there which is great. I, I mean, this has been wonderful from my perspective, Nick. I mean, I just, I enjoy getting your take because you have, have been around, you know, the transaction world and the consolidation world really from a, a very early, early stage and uh, kind of had a front row seat to, to the last, you know, seven to 10 years of, of rapid growth. So, you know, I certainly appreciate you uh, coming in. I don't know, James, if you had any uh, kind of key parting thoughts on, uh, on, on our conversation with Nick. Yeah, I mean, to me, the biggest things are if you're a hospital owner, focus on culture and building a team that wants to work together and is aligned in the vision and partnering with a with an outfit, if that's what your plan is, uh, that shares that same vision. I mean, that to me is huge. I love the WAG acronym for many reasons, but I like that in, in the evaluation piece. Interest rate stability, tremendously important. I don't think that is something that you know, a practice owner is going to focus on too much, but they should be because that's obviously very important and how that ultimately affects the value of their practice and then how their investment does if, if it's with a, a, a corporate group. So to me, those are the two biggest things I think I'd pull out of here. Uh, it's been fantastic in your your take, Nick. Obviously, you've got a sure. incredibly rich background and, and, you know, have a very interesting perspective. So we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, sure, I, sure. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm not going to let him off without our, our kind of question. <laughs> so, you know, we always kind of wrap it up, Nick. And, you know, the question yeah. is, everybody wants to change the world. No one wants to change the toilet paper. Have you ever snuck out of the uh, the bathroom and, and just left that empty toilet paper roll sitting in the bathroom? Too much responsibility. I'm one of those paid forward kind of people. I wouldn't want that done to me. So <laughs> do on to others, right? Kind of a deal. <laughs> it's it's the right thing to do now yeah you know, by all means i can be evil as an XR. so if you're targeting somebody then maybe for sure, but <laughs> not it's, it's, it, it doesn't seem proper there's different ways to uh to get somebody back than that one thing gentlemen i i know you're wrapping this discussion up tell me if this is an appropriate time to share just one more thought because we talked about just what folks can focus on is that something that you wanted me to just kind of continue on I, you actually jumped jumped my concluding question which is yeah, i always perfect. follow up that last Please. question with you know what's kind of your one piece of of parting sure. advice nick or guidance or insight that you think would be most important for uh, our listeners to hear yeah, I'm listening to your podcast in the past, I guess I <laughs> knew that was coming in some respect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is great. Yeah, keep people yeah. on their toes. No, no, right. I, I guess right. that means we've been around long enough. Like, this, this, the surprise question used to work, but now everybody knows it's coming. That's right. Well, I like, to, if anyone knows that it works with me, I like to definitely change up a little bit. It uh, yeah. makes things fun. Yeah, I mean, the parting thoughts that I would have for anybody that's looking to plan is plan, right? Plan it out properly. Have a plan, have your team in place. There's, there's really a good value put on an attorney that understands transactions. Your CPA is always going to be someone you're going to heavily rely on, right? You, oh, your financial advisor really needs to be the quarterback of your team and really help you understand little things, what you're trying to achieve, your wealth gap. Because the average business owner, 80 to 90% of their net worth is tied up in their business. So it, you can only, in most cases, right, the majority can only sell your own business once. I've heard stories of people telling it a couple of times. But focus on the things you can control, right? You don't have to change the world. You just so subtle things you can do with your practices. Recruiting is always hard. If you're having a hard time finding people, rethink what you're doing. 
if you're looking at your, you may not have the right production capacity, if you will, and you may have to change some things there. Facility capacity is very underrated. The more you can do, and again, the juice has to be worth the squeeze, invest in your facility. Do people want to work there? Is it nice, right? Do you, are you proud of it? Do you, do you describe it to somebody on the outside as this is your average run of the practice? Or when you give somebody a tour, are you so excited to show them the bathroom because you really put a lot of emphasis on the building and you have the space to grow into it. exam rooms, treatment space. These are the things that, quite frankly, are going to drive revenue in the long term. And these are the things that the groups are looking for. You can't change your demographics, right? It's very rare you move your hospital from one location to another. You can work on culture. Definitely always work on Google reviews because millennials, I'm a Gen Xer. I don't really read them that often. But millennials make the majority of their buying decisions based on, you know, three hospitals in an area, which one's got the strongest reviews. So put a strong emphasis on that. But those are the things you can control. So create a plan. Work with people that are going to help you create that plan. Have your trusted advisors help you guide you through that process. And if if operating the hospital for another year or so is going to get you to that point, definitely be coached up to do that. But to make those changes on a positive light, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create, is trying to drive up value creation, you know, growing revenue, improving profit margin to a normal sense. I mean, I've seen hospitals come with an excessively high profit margin, and that's usually not always the best thing. Sometimes of a group starting to acquire even it. But that that's to wrap it up in a shorter version, which is look at the top four or five things that you can control that are going to drive long-term revenue and growth in your practice and not at the expense of your health or your well-being. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's begin with the end in mind type of deal yes. and and plan, right? Like, I mean, that's that is just amazing advice, I, I think. Nick, thanks again for joining yep. us. This is episode 14 of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. Guest Nick Uva from SVP. Nick, last thing, where can people find you if they want to reach out? Yeah, I mean, uh, www.svp.vet is obviously the company's website. Uh, my name, again, is Nick Uva. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with Southern Veteran Partners. I have a LinkedIn profile. So I'm easily found, obviously, through the company's website. You know, that's that's the best way to reach out. Easy enough. That's awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Nick. We appreciate your time. Hey, thanks guys. Thank you so much. And appreciate podcast. you doing. You got it. See ya. Thanks again for tuning in to the Vet Worthwhile podcast. You can find us online at signaturefd.com slash signature veterinary. And then our ask would be if you found this episode valuable, just think of one friend or colleague that you think would enjoy the content and just, just please share. So thanks again. We'll see you next time. Travis York is the owner of 3 and one Vet Advisors and a partner of Signature FD. 3 and one Vet Advisors is a veterinary consulting and strategic planning firm of which Signature FD has no involvement or ownership. James Yost is a partner and wealth advisor at Signature FD. Signature FD is an investment advisor registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. 3 and one Vet Advisors and Signature FD are not affiliated. Mr. York provides all non-investment advisory services through 3-in-1 Vet Advisors. The opinions of the guests and the contents of this podcast are intended to be educational only and should not be relied upon as investment, tax, business, or planning advice. You should consult with a professional advisor prior to taking any course of action that may impact you or your business.